And remarks now from gun control advocates, a pediatrician, a pastor, and the head of a smart gun technology foundation. They recently discussed gun violence, mass shootings, and public health at the Commonwealth Club of California in San Francisco. From September, this is about an hour, 10 minutes. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. <laughs> you can find the Commonwealth Club online at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Mark Fullman, National Affairs Editor for Mother Jones, and your moderator for tonight's program, Gun Violence and Public Health, underwritten by the California Wellness Foundation. The data on gun violence in the United States is sobering. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, each year more than 33,000 Americans are killed by guns, and at least 80,000 are treated in hospitals for non-fatal gunshot wounds. More than 20,000 of the gun deaths per year are suicides. Hundreds of kids die annually in gun homicides, and each week seems to bring news of another child accidentally shooting himself or a sibling with an unsecured firearm. While violent crime overall has declined steadily in recent years, rates of gun-related injury and death have climbed since 2011, and public mass shootings have become more frequent. Among 15 to 24-year-olds, gun fatalities are about to surpass car accidents as the leading cause of death. In the last several years, U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy and organizations such as the American Bar Association, the American Public Health Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics have all urged that gun violence should be regarded as a serious public health issue. What are the realities of gun violence in our country? What kinds of innovative solutions are being put forth to reduce the carnage? Tonight, our panel is here to discuss how gun-related injuries and deaths impact the health of Americans and their communities, and what can be done to help solve the problem. Joining us are Dr. Ricky Choi, who serves on the Board of Directors for the National Physicians Alliance, Margot Hirsch, President of the Smart Tech Challenges Foundation, Pastor Michael McBride, lead pastor at the Way Christian Center in Berkeley, California, and director of urban strategies at PICO National Network, and Robin Thomas, executive director of the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the Commonwealth Club. So I'd like to begin with a basic question about gun violence as a public health issue. Why should it be considered a public health issue and, and why doesn't the general public tend to see it as a major public health issue? And maybe we can start with you, Dr. Choi. Public health is about promoting and protecting the health of people and communities where they live, work, go to school, and play. Public health is about promoting healthy behaviors, reducing injury and harm, and gun violence is a direct threat to these aims. <coughs> Physicians are on the front lines every day dealing with this in our hospitals and our clinics. Except for the situations where victims end up in the morgue, all of these victims end up in our clinics. And we feel that's very strongly the National Physicians Alliance and a lot of other physician organizations. There is consensus that gun violence is a public health issue that we, uh, as healthcare providers, uh, need to take very seriously as a primary care physician, for me to talk to my patients about guns in the home, review safety measures um, if they do. Robin, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that traditionally people think about public health issues in terms of things like diseases, um, the kinds of problems that confront our society that we don't have that same level of agency and control over sometimes. And with gun violence, I, I think the perception, similar to, to cars, I think that's a good analogy, um, that there isn't 
a way to address it because of the agency, the intervention of human agency that's involved in the problem. But if you take a step back from that and you look at public health as a situation where communities are in danger and being harmed, and there are both preventative ways to address the problem, you can make guns safer the way we did with cars, you can affect people's behaviors, the way that they treat and store and deal with guns, the guns themselves can be made safer. So I, I think when it comes to public health, people hear the word public health and they think of you know chicken pox. They don't think of something like cars and guns as being public health crises. Yet if you look at the number of people being harmed by all kinds of diseases that very readily we take steps to prevent and to deal with these problems and to keep them from harming people, it's so obvious when you look at the 100,000 people getting shot every year that this is an absolute epidemic. Um, and it should be viewed that way because there are so many things that can be done that would have an impact on those numbers. One of the countervailing arguments to epidemic is that on a percentage basis or as a relative um, portion of the population that the gun violence problem is very small. Um, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on how this is seen at the local level in communities and in medical facilities. What are, what are people not seeing about gun violence that goes beyond just what we see in the kind of daily drumbeat of news, which frankly, I think a lot of people are desensitized to at this point. Pastor McBride, maybe you can comment. Well, I, I certainly think that, you know, the, the reality around the daily impacts and effects of gun violence, um, at least in the way I imagine and experience it, um, is not always very quanti quantifiable through news reports. Um, the level of trauma that uh, families and communities are constantly having to process and uh, address, whether they themselves are victimized by gun violence, where, whether folks in their immediate family have been victimized by gun violence, or whether it is a larger communal uh, impact related to trauma. Um, so, of course, uh, when we see the way these issues are covered in the news uh, and media, which I think is the kind of largely uh, uh, kind of uh, pipeline of how we get and process information, um, it's largely solely demonstrated as an act of violence or a, a, a very abrasive violation. Um, but rarely is it narrated in a way where uh, people are constantly having to live in many of our communities uh, in this country in war zones that are actually assaulting the psychology, uh, the emotion, and the spirit uh, of, of uh, young people and families far beyond just the physical toll. So I think the daily impact, is, at least how we understand it, particularly here in the Bay Area, is very much around trauma. I mean, just, just really quickly, 600 uh, um, shootings have happened in the Bay Area, averaged over the last, say, 20 years. Um, city of Oakland, I'm talking about specifically city of Oakland, 120 uh, killings or so average. So you can just imagine the concentric circles of trauma of, of families that have had to deal with gun-related homicides, not even speaking about suicide. So I think trauma is, is something we have to continue to imagine. Right, and, and of course, as you're suggesting, it's not just literally the victims themselves or even their immediate families, that the impact of this is, goes far beyond that. Um, I'm sure that you see that in in, in the day-to-day -day in hospitals too, Dr. Choi. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really sad thing in the Bay Area when uh, we know when it's gonna be a hot summer, we'll be seeing more gun, gun victims um, in our pediatric wards. There's this kind of anecdotal relationship. Warm summers, more gunshot victims um, on the pediatric ward. You know, we did a survey. It was an informal survey of our members, 20,000 physicians in our organization, asking them, what is your number? You know, when you reflect on medical school, residency, in your practice, in your personal lives, how many gun violence victims have you had any interaction with? And the num average number was 40. That's an incredible number. And I think that, again, reminds us that, you know, we are in, med in healthcare and in medicine at this really important intersection where we're trying to care for the victims of violence but also have the opportunity to, to, to take one step, move one step ahead, and try to st take steps toward prevention as well. Margot Hirsch, uh, as someone who is working in, in the realm of, of solutions, I mean, we're talking about the Bay Area and the, the problems here, which in some ways are reflected in every major cosmopolitan area in the country. 
Um, but the Bay Area is the epicenter of technological innovation. Um, you know, we, we often in America have produced, we're producing world changing technology and specifically here. What, what technologies are available to us now to address this problem? The primary technologies that we're seeing today um, through, the techno through the challenge that the Smart Tech Foundation started in January 2014 are primarily uh, biometric technologies, so fingerprint reading um, and RFID radio frequency. Those are the two standouts right now. Um, they are effective in different use cases, a biometric fingerprint reading Reader would be extremely effective in a personal protection home environment or a gun range where there's no dirt, no water, no blood. Um, whereas for hunters who might have dirty hands or wear gloves, an RFID solution might be more effective. Also for law enforcement, RFID could be potentially a preferred solution because um, it requires you to wear a ring or a bracelet in order to fire the trigger of a firearm. Alternatively, you could put um, a small chip into your hand because for law enforcement, you actually have to be able to fire out of both hands. And a concern is that if the gun was taken away or if you injured yourself, you'd have to be able to use someone else's gun or fire out of your other hand. So that technology could be very effective. We're also seeing things like smart ammunition, which is unusual, uh, another approach. Um, and we're also seeing a variety of technologies that can be um, retrofitted to existing firearms because there are 300 million firearms in this country today. So not only do you have to think about the new firearms, which are 10 million that come into the market every year, but you've got all those existing firearms out there that you'd want to make safer as well. So we're seeing retrofit technologies, external locking technologies, which are very interesting, as well as a few that are actually integrated into the gun itself. They sound like some promising technologies, and yet I think few people have heard of them even. Why have they not taken better hold? Um, very good point. I think one of the big issues is that there's no market demand for these technologies because people aren't aware of them. There, um, there's been no incentive in the past to get involved in this type of project because um, the NRA has not been extremely supportive of bringing these types of technologies to market. Um, Back in 1990, Colt received some funding to develop smart guns, and they were boycotted. And then in 2000, Smith & Wesson, through the Clinton administration, received funding to develop a smart gun. And they, too, were boycotted, almost went out of business. So the um, gun manufacturers have no desire to jump into this space. And then for people, new innovators, um, there's a lack of capital available for them because when you go to raise money, a venture capitalist is going to say, well, what's the market opportunity? How big is the market demand? And there really isn't a market demand because the technologies don't exist. So it's, it's a real catch-22 that at the foundation we're trying to deal with and hopefully overcome. Well, technology certainly seems like one promising avenue, but of course, you know, what's done at the community level is, is a much more complicated picture and, and varies widely depending on where you are in the country. Um, Pastor McBride, what, what do you think are the most crucial things that local community leaders are doing on this issue or perhaps should be doing? Well, you know, I think that the first thing we all have to do is change our assumption that this problem is unsolvable. And I think there's a certain intractability as relates to uh, what people believe um, is inevitable, particularly as it relates to gun violence in urban communities. Um, for the last 10 years or so, uh, we have been engaging in a number of strategies that have pop popularly been known as ceasefire um, to help reduce uh, the number of firearm offenders um, and offenses uh, in our communities across the country. And we've had amazing results, particularly we just pointed here in the Bay Area since 2007, um, eight, 2007 or 8, we've seen a 60 to 70 percent decline in gun-related homicides in the city of Richmond. 
Um, the city of Oakland, the last several years, we've seen almost a 30, 40 percent reduction in homicide. And the reason is um, many of the firearm offenders or people who are engaged in gun violence, uh, it's a very small number of individuals. If you have 100 uh, gun-related shootings uh, or gun-related homicides in the city, it's not because you have 100 individual firearm offenders or shooters. It's because you have a small number of individuals who are engaging in volume activity. So our work has been to actually interact and engage with those individuals and uh, interrupt uh, their uh, engagement. The, the analogy I use is many of these young people are caught on a dryer cycle. How many of y'all know, seen a dryer, you know, do y'all know what dryers are? You know, you dry your clothes <laughs> and it's twirling, twirling, twirling. And, you know, if you open the dryer, clothes start flying out, right? Um, because it's been on a cycle for so long. Well, many of us have never opened the door um, of these cycles. And I have found that when you open doors and pathways for individuals to actually um, choose different kinds of choices, many of them, the overwhelming majority of them, stop shooting with no incentive um, because many of them want to live. They just have not had those kind of cycles interrupted with love, with structure, and with the pathway out. So those strategies are strategies we're trying to bring to scale all across the country and even more so here in the Bay Area. But we do find that that allows us to engage in public safety measures that do not criminalize whole communities, send more of our black and brown young people to jail and prison, and keep our communities intact. And we're finding great promise. We just need a lot more political support, a lot more constitutional policing to help us have legitimacy in the community and uh, certainly a lot more uh, resources. So hopefully all those things will continue to come together. You mentioned um, policing. Policing in the United States is, and, and officer-involved shootings in particular have become a major national issue in the last year or so. Um, how, how do you think that might be affecting perceptions of the gun violence problem in our country? Well, it's a big perception um, problem because uh, since the war on drugs, well, let, let, let me just say this. In 1939, a prominent um, clergy uh, mentor of mine was born in the South, and his mom registered him as the lifelong member of the NAACP. And the number one issue of the NAACP in 1939 was police brutality. It was long before the war on drugs, long before the Black Panther Party, long before the Civil Rights Movement, long before, uh, you know, uh, uh, integration. Um, police brutality. There has not been one day that black folk have been in the United States and not have their lives subject to arbitrary violence by the state or by its law enforcement apparatus. So it's important to historic, historicize this conversation because I then think it helps us to appreciate that what we're seeing around the tipping point around police reform is a long time coming. Our strategies that depend on us working with law enforcement to be able to do constitutional policing in communities um, require us to have policing services that are constitutional, uh, that are not dominated by rogue, lethal force policing. And uh, even here in the city, earlier today, I was at a rally for Amacar Lopez, another young Latino brother named Alex Nieto. Many of us know maybe stories of Oscar Grant. Many cases where law enforcement are actively engaging in violent, and even lethal acts, that erodes community trust that is necessary to actually create the kind of public safety partnership. So these things are inextricably linked. When people say, what about black on black crime? I say, what about constitutional policing? Because we can't have one without the other. And I think uh, for me, that is the tie in. And we work on both sides of the issue. Um, and uh, I hope that people will really begin to see the connections or else we won't have the public safety results, particularly around gun violence that we all say we want and need. Another aspect that's come up with the, the policing issue in people I've spoken with in the world of law enforcement, um, and Robin Thomas, maybe you can comment on this. Um, you know, a lot of police go out in, into their daily work with the expectation that everybody's armed and dangerous. And there's a lot of discussion ab about the the kind of uh, warrior mentality that police are trained to have. And as Pastor McBride saying that, you know, that's causing serious problems in terms of the local community fabric. Um, when you think about that in terms of gun violence as a public health issue, gun violence as a highly charged political issue and, and the legal landscape, what are your thoughts about that? The way that that's now come to the forefront with policing? I mean, 
I think when you think about and you talk about gun violence, you need to look at it as a holistic problem. It's not a problem you can solve purely through community approaches, even though I think that's absolutely crucial in some communities. It's certainly not a problem, even though we really work on the policy side that's going to be solved through policy solutions. It, you, it has to be approached holistically. So uh, Pastor McBride and I often talk about the supply side problem and the demand side problem in a lot of communities. I mean, there's a demand side problem that needs to be met through innovative, thoughtful, integrated community mechanisms. But we have to deal with the flow of firearms into these communities, which is so prolific and so unchecked. Um, and that's creating an, another piece of the puzzle. And I think looking at those two things hand in hand and the way that they fit together is is really important. You know, one of our, the policies that we've always cared about is um, assault weapons and large capacity ammunition. And partly that's because of, you know, you see a mass shooting, that's the kind of weaponry that's being utilized. But it's also because there's this sort of arms war that happens in inner cities where, you know, not as badly in California because the laws are stronger, but certainly happens here and is even far worse in other cities where law enforcement demands stronger and stronger weapons to contend with the types of weapons that they're encountering. Now, whether that's even true or not is irrelevant because if that's the perception, I mean, you look at what happened in Ferguson, that kind of military force being brought into a community is crazy. And, and part of the argument behind that was, well, we have to be able to take on these assault weapons that are now proliferating everywhere. I mean, there's millions of them, in, you know, legally and illegally. Um, so I think that, that that sort of arms war problem that we have in this country with so many guns, I think that, you know, the ready availability of the AR-15s and other assault weapons that have become, you know, the choice weapons in a lot of, um, you know, illegal enterprises as well as for, you know, horrific tragedies, um, you know, should spur action. Unfortunately, um, what hasn't been mentioned that much yet on this panel is the NRA and the force that lobbying brings to the equation and how that inhibits us from being able to approach things holistically and with a real um, clear eye for solutions. We have research. Um, Dr. Choi and I have talked at length about the types of research that exist as to what policies are out there that work. Do, what evidence do we have of what works? And the problem is even when we know what works, we can't get it in place because we have this really interesting um, special interest group that, that inhibits us from, from really tackling this problem with intelligence, with solutions that we, we know are available. What do you see is at the top of the list of those policies that, that we know work and yet can't be put in place? Universal background checks. I mean, not even a pause. We need to have absolutely background checks on every single sale and transfer of weapons in this country by law. It doesn't mean we're going to completely stop the flow, but because guns, unlike something like drugs, are actually manufactured legitimately and have to be imported and tracked, if you just put in place universal background checks for every sale, you can begin to assess where they're coming from, who's getting them, how are they getting them, in a way that's simply impossible now because you don't need a background check in a private sale. So there's no system in place that helps us even understand the flow of the 300 million guns in this country. So that's just step one, but I think it's absolutely crucial. And what you're describing is, from the perception of the American public, not a radical idea. Right. 92% of the American people after Newtown um, when polled, supported universal background checks on all sales. And that's in you know, Wyoming and Alabama and everywhere. And yet our Senate only managed to muster uh, 54 votes to put that in place. So unfortunately, even though Americans want it, our leaders don't represent the will of what the American people want and need to address this problem. And I think, I think we have to ask the question why. And I think um, what the NRA has done a, a wonderful job along with gun manufacturers is peddling fear. Um, you know, many of us were in the Senate um, during Dianne Feinstein's hearing um, several weeks after the Newtown tragedy, and we heard Lindsey Graham from South Carolina um, just go on this long diatribe about um, how the police would not be able to come and protect us in our homes when the looters come and when the, 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 at the, gate. the you know, all these, the, the the natural disasters come, and you're going to need your guns. And, and, and um, you know, Lindsey Graham know, should know better. I mean, he's, you know, not, not you know, a, a someone who I think believes that in his heart, but it's, it's politics of fear and the fear of the other, the, the ways in which people feel like they need to have a gun in order to protect themselves when all the research says 
And if you own a gun, you're more likely to be harmed by that gun or a member in your family be harmed by that gun. So it's a, it's a cruel joke, um, cruel irony that's being played on the American people and um, until we're able to overcome our fears with more hope and, and love for one another, I think um, NRA and these weapon manufacturers will actually continue to provide cover for elected officials to keep doing things that they know aren't creating public safety. I think one of the things we're getting at here, too, is that the politics of, of guns has a way of obscuring some important things about the issue. Um, we tend to focus a lot on mass shootings, on homicides, um, but according to CDC data, more than 20,000 gun-related deaths each year, which is approximately two-thirds of the annual toll, are suicides. Mm -hmm. More than 80% of suicide attempts using a gun are successful. Yet as a country, we tend to think of homicides as the biggest part of the problem. Why is that, Dr. Choi? You know, if we look at adolescence, for example, two of the top three causes of death and what we would typically think of as a healthy, uh, a healthy population are homicides and suicides, mm. both of which um, have very close associations with guns. You know, we were just talking about evidence. Evidence shows that having a gun in the home increases the risk of suicide and unintentional injury. Um, we know that providing advice, telling families uh, that if you lock up your gun, keep it unloaded, keep the ammunition separate from the gun, that not only do patients listen, um, but it actually does reduce um, the risk of injury and harm. This is a particular concern when it comes to children. And there have been studies that, talk about, that show that while parents think that their kids don't know where their guns are, mm. the kids do. And anyone who has any recent experience with an inquisitive child knows um, that they, they find those things. So I think that, you know, that recognizing this data requires us to then take that next step and doing and, and and follow up with an intervention. And while we have some of this data, uh, I think one of the frustrations in the medical community is that we don't have enough data. Mm. In the mid 90s, uh, um, the gun lobby blocked uh, funding for gun research around gun violence. Um, and in fact, explicitly stated that the CDC could not pursue research around gun violence. So what we don't know um, is still hurting us. Now, recently there, that has changed, and there is a presidential order that allows the CDC to pursue research, but there still isn't funding. So there's this big problem that we know is there, and we, st we think we know some things, we don't know enough, and to build, continue to build a strong case of kind of things that we already know is true is challenging in this context. Um, and so, you know, they've tied us up when we talk about public health and research in a couple different ways. Another issue that comes up a lot um, in the context of mass shootings, which tend to get the most attention in the national media, is mental health. Um, can you talk a little bit about the connection between mental health and gun violence, what people understand and don't understand about that? I think that, you know, in, when, we, when there are, are, are these mass shootings and the first question that becomes, what's wrong with the shooter? Um, do they have a mental illness? And we start to straddle a very challenging political line where is it we need to spend more money on mental health? Yes, yes we do. Do we need to spend more money on reducing gun violence, reducing guns, background checks, and other policy issues? Yes, we do. But they're pitted against each other. And, and uh, unfortunately, that doesn't help um, either of these important um, needs. It's true that those with a history of, uh, of uh, uh, juvenile crime in the past, those with a history of substance abuse, those with a history of the mental um, health issues are at a higher risk of, um, uh, of, of gun violence, but to turn it upside down certainly isn't true. Everyone who is a substance user, everyone who is, um, has a mental illness is not necessarily a threat um, to, uh, to the general public and to themselves. It's a very challenging thing to try to nail down, to identify that person who is having a variety of personal issues, whether or not they're really truly to be a threat to themselves and to other people. It's a challenge that physicians and elder healthcare providers are, are, are dealing with every single day. But the importance is to narrow in on, uh, on, on that particular um, uh, group of people um, and not to have this broad, broad swath of saying, oh yeah, everyone who's you know, uh, committed um, homicide must have a mental health issue. And all people with mental health issues necessarily are threats to themselves in the community.
I would just add to that that if you look at other countries, I think it provides a really interesting comparison because we don't have higher rates of mental illness in this country than other countries do. We don't have more violent video games in this country than anywhere else. And yet our rates of gun death are so far surpass any other industrialized nation on earth. In fact, there's even other industrialized countries with a lot of guns, like Canada, who also have rates of mental illness like ours, violent video games, who don't have the kind of gun death rate that we do. So you have to ask yourself, yes, do we have you know, mental health issues that need better funding and better, better addressed, particularly veterans? Uh, 22 suicides a day every day in this country with guns are veterans, 22 veteran suicides every single day. I mean, that is astounding to me. Um, maybe a separate conversation, but I think a really important piece of information. So is mental illness a problem? Yes, but that's not the gun problem, right? Because you can see if you take a step back that that's not what's causing it. It's the easy access that you have when you have any kind of issue, um, whether it's depression, whether it's um, you know, frustration that the gun is right there. 75% of the suicides of people under the age of 19 are not the person's gun. It's somebody else's gun. So it's an impulsive act. And when guns are so easily available, not locked up, and so easy to find in that moment, um, you see drastic consequences. You have 1.7 million unlocked and loaded guns in homes today. So one in three homes today have a gun and over 55% have a gun that's unlocked, not in a gun safe. And that's primarily because gun owners feel uh, they're typically quite responsible and lock up the bulk of their guns, but they want one out of the safe, very easily accessible for personal protection. And that's oftentimes where these problems come in because they're not always locked up and they are oftentimes unloaded, uh, loaded and that's when children and people who are high risk can easily access them, access them and use them. So I think on a similar note, um, why, why is it that we have an, an inordinate problem with gun violence? When we compare ourselves to other countries, I mean, this is in a sense one of the most difficult questions of this issue, right? But if we think about it holistically, we think about it from a public health perspective, um, we don't have a monopoly on mental health problems. We don't have a monopoly on violent movies or video games. Why do we have so much more gun violence in this country? And I put that to anyone on the panel who would like to respond. Pastor McBride? Well, <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I think it's a couple things. I mean, you know, I'll certainly be speaking probably from a, a place of, of uh, just personal reflection. You know, the, the, the legacy of violence that this country has been founded on, um, you know, as a, you know, colonizing, um, you know, force, I think has, has really sowed seeds of violence in the soil of our country that probably requires, um, you know, this, this maybe, you know, latent persistent fear that, you know, somebody's going to come back, <laughs> come back and get, get you and get us maybe. Um, I, I think, you know, there's a culture of violence that is just a part of the fabric of the United States of America. Um, and while there are always folks that believe, you know, we need to get our country back to the good old days, I think we should always remember that the days have never been good for a large number <laughs> of people. Um, and, and, and that has been because of the presence of arbitrary violence. So I think that's certainly one thing. And, and then I also think that... Um, I think it's a deeply moral problem. I think it speaks to, um, you know, a, a hole in the soul of America that we have become um, so callous in the value of life um, that uh, we, we have and we share um, for uh, our neighbor. Um, and I think that has spilled over to a certain sense of hopelessness that a lot of people um, are carrying um, that may even cause them at times to feel like they don't have any other options but to take their own lives. So I, I think it's a very uh, convoluted issue, but I, I, do, I do believe that certainly as a faith leader, someone who believes very deeply in spirituality and purpose um, and in origins, I, I do think that our country has a legacy of violence that um, is always a backdrop. And I, I think it, it continues to inform perhaps the way 
um, in which we uh, have marched um, from the past into our present and into our future. That's why I think all of us need to be advocating for more peacemaking work broadly in our country um, and not always resulting to violence to solve our problems, whether they are domestic or abroad. I have a, a related question from the audience um, suggesting that the fundamental issue may be poor parenting. Guns are not the problem. It's the lack of education, especially in single parent families. How do you solve that issue? Get rid of the guns. <laughs> so I always tell folks, you know, um, every gun related homicide costs the city on the low end two million dollars. It can maybe some, the Rand Report I think has it as high as five million dollars. Um, and and it's, a, it's a vicious cycle, right, because the kinds of resources then that every general fund in a municipality has to spend to either deal with the homicides that are happening in our communities or the officers that are often used as a political ploy to expand their budgets are all coming from the general fund. <clears throat> If all the money is being poured into public safety, then you don't have resources left to put into schools and parks and jobs and, and all these other kinds of things that I think all of us would say is a priority. Um, so I, I, think, I think part of what we have to do is make some very important choices about what do we value the most. Um, I kind of reject the idea that poor parenting is the result of, of or is a cause for gun violence. Um, because that would seem to presuppose that, uh, you know, poor parents are only in one community. Um, you know, how many of y'all had some poor parents? Keep it real, 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 right? No. Um, so I, I think it's, it's something much more complex than that. Um, but I hear that often. I guess I'm just used to rejecting that notion. I know I would totally second that. Touch I mean, I think name, that the, <laughs> the, um, the idea that the problem is that simple. I don't know if that person who wrote that question doesn't have children or doesn't have enough children, but <laughs> I can guarantee you, you get enough children, whether they're from poor families or rich families, and you will encounter children who have issues and are unmanageable and are prone to violence, whether it's one reason or another, and that's not always parenting. Uh, which is not to say that there aren't a lot of things that we try to do as parents to help our children go down the right path, but the idea to me that Americans are somehow worse parents than in any other country, and that's why we have a gun violence problem, is astounding. I think it totally fails to recognize the real issues that poor communities do face. Uh, when you're confronted with violence in your community every single day, the challenge is far different. Um, when you have hopelessness, when you don't have jobs, when you don't have good education, I mean, those are issues that can help children have the hope, have the path that they need. And parents can only do so much without a community that supports them um, and with sort of what children are forced to witness in the community in which they live. So, you know, I find that question borderline insulting because I think it doesn't take into account the realities and the difficulties and the complexities that, that certainly many communities face, poor and rich, but are more prevalent in poor communities because they don't have the resources and support. Dr. Choi? Just as someone, as a pediatrician who talks a lot about parenting, and as a dad of three kids, yeah, and woefully inefficient, I mean insufficient in terms of my parenting skills, um, thinking about that every day, right? How the many ways I could have done this or done that. Just to turn that suggestion on, the head, on its head is to say that we're all responsible, right? Um, to try to be a good role model, you know, to be the faith leader, to be the pediatrician, to be, you know, the person on the street that shows children and, and young adults, and all of us for that matter, the role model, good ways of conflict re resol uh, resolution, right? How we engage one another, um, how we handle aggression. And we kind of move that even further to talk about media, right? When we talk about the, the public health successes around motor vehicle accidents and tobacco, media campaigns, a proper, you know, putting role models on television about gun violence and, um, and the dangers of it. Education campaigns around those things. Uh, I think that we all have a tremendous opportunity to, to play a role, to provide some of that influence um, as suggested in that question. Um, and so I encourage all, all of you to do so. You're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Tonight's discussion is gun violence and public health underwritten by the California Wellness Foundation. 
Our panelists are Dr. Ricky Choi, who serves on the board of directors for the National Physicians Alliance, Margot Hirsch, president of the Smart Tech Challenges Foundation, Pastor Michael McBride, lead pastor at the Way Christian Center in Berkeley, California, and director of urban strategies at PICO National Network, and Robin Thomas, executive director of the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. I'm Mark Fullman, national affairs editor for Mother Jones, and your moderator for tonight's program. We touched on the economic cost of gun violence a little bit earlier. Uh, recently, Mother Jones collaborated with a top uh, public health economist to investigate the, the economic toll of gun violence, and we found it to be at least $229 billion a year. That's more than what our country spends on obesity and almost as much as we spend on Medicaid. In some ways, the $229 billion annual figure is a conservative estimate. What does this massive economic cost mean in terms of public health and, and health in our communities, and are people even aware of it? Um, one of the statistics I read, and one of the facts that we talk a lot about in trying to show the correlation between uh, the prevalence of guns and gun violence is that in states where you have really strong gun regulations, where you have much lower uh, ownership rates of guns, you have much lower gun violence and gun death rates. Uh, it's not a causation argument, but it is a correlation, and that's very obvious. California, for example, has one of the lowest gun death rates in the country, even though we have some of the urban issues and other problems that we have, far lower per capita than a place like Wyoming. And the state of Hawaii has one of the lowest costs per capita for gun violence. I think it's $200 a person a year. Wyoming's cost per person per year for gun violence, taxpayer cost, is $1,400 a year, right? That's just... Wyoming, not a state that people think of as having a huge gun violence problem, but it does because there's so many guns in so many hands. So I think that it all, again, fits together. You have high gun ownership, you have high gun death rates, and the cost, not just to communities, forget the human cost, the financial cost, is tremendous. Um, and, it, and most of that cost flows directly to the taxpayer. Um, so we're all paying the cost every day of, of this issue. It's not just something that's borne by individual families and communities, which is bad enough. And you certainly see that in the medical world too, right, Dr. Choi, in terms of the, the burden on hospitals. The estimated, the estimated cost of gun violence to hospitals is on the order of $2 billion a year. <laughs> I think that that money is probably much better spent on invest, investing in public health, right? and interventions that we know work, addressing social determinants of health, like poverty, homelessness, translation services. This is, you know, we're, this goes back to the commonly used phrase, we don't have a health care system, we have a sick care system. And if we really want to move forward in terms of, you know, creating a healthy society, um, the aims of public health, um, you know, it's investing um, in those areas um, is much better spent. We haven't talked a lot about the politics, and yet they're an undeniable important part of this picture and, and the role of the National Rifle Association and other gun lobbyists. Is it fair to ascribe so much blame to the gun lobby in terms of standing in the way of the things that we know that work, the evidence-based solutions, the technologies? Um, in, in some ways, they're, they're an easy villain. Um, how does that equation work out in, in the reality of policy making, whether it's in the medical world or trying to bring forth technological solutions. Well, here's a, a clear example. As we had already discussed, you know, um, there is evidence that shows that taking proper precautions at home, locking up the gun, keeping it separate from its ammunition, keeping it unloaded, works. When doctors talk about it, patients listen. However, the gun lobby has taken active steps to prevent physicians from having this kind of conversation. In states such as Florida and Missouri, and other states have, uh, um, have similar ambitions, is now illegal. This is physicians will be punished if they have that kind of conversation with their patients. Not only does that infringe on First Amendment rights of, of physicians to free speech, but also gets in the way of doing things that we know works. And, of course, infringes on what we view as the sacred physician-patient relationship. So I think that you know, that we should be very concerned. There are active efforts to erode, um, you know, those things that we know work, um, and uh, we need to work very hard to overturn those, uh, those types of laws. 
I think with, with health and with technology, Margot Hirsch, you know, why, why would the NRA want to stand in the way of potential solutions like this? I mean, it's in no one's interest, whether you're conservative on gun rights or liberal on gun rights. Nobody wants to see people die from guns, from gun crime, from suicide. Why, why are they standing in the way of technology? Their concern is that smart guns or this type of technology will lead to mandates around the technology and infringe on their Second Amendment rights, which is what they always bring up. Um, in the case of a company called Armatix uh, last year, they're a German manufacturer that brought the first RFID smart gun to the U.S. and it was first showcased at a gun club in Southern California and it received a fair amount of press and all of a sudden the gun club removed the gun completely from its club and its shelves, completely disavowed, knowing the manu manufacturer, Armatix. And that also happened at a, um, in Maryland at another gun uh, reseller where they received death threats from the gun community because they were offering this gun for sale. And the Armatix gun is no longer sold at this point in time. So um, what's happened is that there's no incentive, and if anything, there's a fear of retribution for um, firearm dealers to offer for sale any sort of smart gun technology because they're concerned that their businesses will get boycotted and, and essentially go out of business. Um, there's a mandate in the state of New Jersey. Um, it's called the Child Proof Handgun Law that was passed in 2002, and the NRA uses that as something to point to that says Armatix triggered this law, and C, smart guns will lead to mandates. So it's, it's unfortunately the law that they passed in New Jersey had the best of intentions to keep children safe by mandating that in three years when a smart gun came to market, all guns had to be smart guns to protect children. Um, but in a sense, no pun intended, it's backfired. And, um, and it's been a huge hindrance in terms of getting these technologies to market. Robin Thomas? I don't think there's any doubt that the NRA is a huge impediment to um, innovative and uh, you know, sort of big thinking approaches to this, prob to this problem. Once upon a time, the NRA was a gun safety organization out of you know World War One and World War II to help train people to shoot. Um, and then that changed. And now it is run by a very hardline leadership, which believes in absolutely no gun regulation whatsoever, and I think far more represents the interest of the gun industry and manufacturers in selling more guns than it does uh, gun safety, or interestingly, its own members. When they poll NRA members, 75% of them agree with most of the basic regulations and, and programs we're all talking about. NRA members say, yeah, background check's great. Um, all kinds of, of policies that they agree with, and yet the leadership, the lobbyists that represent the NRA fight tooth and nail against even basic measures like background checks because more guns can be sold the looser the regulations. So I think it's very clear to those of us that are looking closely that the NRA is in fact an impediment to any sort of progress on this issue. They're gonna to continue to be because a ton of their funding comes from gun manufacturers and because their membership has a very small, very vocal base, which are mostly hardline and who are very noisy. And we have 90% of the American public who agrees with us, but it's not their primary issue. They're moderately apathetic about regulation on this issue, so they don't show up to the meetings and the town halls and they don't vote single issue. And these NRA hardliners do. So we have this disconnect between you know 90% of Americans and even NRA members being cool with it, and then this very, very small, very vocal, very hard-line group that has money, that are aggressive, and that are single-issue voters that can really dominate on this, on this small front. Which is, to me, why <clears throat> I think we, we need to ask more of our elected officials. I mean, I think that um, the courage necessary to bring about the change we seek can't always be about your next election, nor can it be about... Um, you know, these uh, moneyed interests. Now, I know that sounds very altruistic, um, and yet at the same time, um, you know, 
uh, people's lives are at stake. And, and I, I have not found progressive lawmakers to be any more courageous on this issue. Uh, we must remember that at the time of Newtown, I mean, the, the, the Senate was, was controlled by Democrats, and they, they couldn't even get all of their own folks to, to pass the bill um, out of the Senate. Um, so I, I just continue to, to believe that we, we have a lot of work to do to, to, to make sure that our lawmakers are, are oriented towards doing the right thing. And it, it is, I think, again, you know, um, unmasking a deep moral challenge that our country has around these sets of issues around the value of life over and against um, political expediency or trying to hold on to uh, power rather than uh, actually serving the people. So, um, you know, a lot of our work in the faith community is trying to actually, you know, uh, as the Pope hopefully influenced John Boehner, uh, <laughs> the last, maybe, maybe some moral force can, can influence a few other lawmakers to do, do what's best for the country and um, not, not their own political careers. Well, I'd like to pick up on what you're saying, uh, Pastor McBride, because I think you're suggesting that, in a sense, the hope for that is much more at the, perhaps at the local and state level. Um, after the Sandy Hook massacre almost three years ago now, as we all know, Congress had a very high profile debate over a background, universal background check bill, failed to pass it. And I think ever since there's been a somewhat pervasive myth that nothing has changed. And yet that's not true at all. There's been a huge amount of legislative activity at the state level. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, Robin Thomas, and, and what has and has not changed since then? Um, I think you put it right that there was, I, I thought of it as a sea change after Newtown. You know, we've been working at the state level for 20 years and we were lucky to get requests from three or four or five states looking to introduce new laws. And in the year after Newtown, we were contacted by 30 states looking to introduce new regulations and eight states passed really sweeping, um, profound laws, including states like New York. Um, Maryland and Delaware and Massachusetts and Colorado um, that have passed really comprehensive regulations modeled in, in large part on California's regulation, which took us 20 years to get in place. And in the year after Newtown, we were able to um, help implement that in a number of states. Um, on the domestic violence front, 18 states have passed new laws in the last three years since Newtown. I mean, states you would never expect, like Wisconsin and Louisiana. Um, we are seeing good mental health progress, states passing laws about that. Even background checks. We now have 18 states with universal background checks on gun sales who have closed loopholes. That's brand new since Newtown. So we are seeing a lot of progress. We are, of course, also seeing some pushback uh, in more conservative red states that are making it easier to get guns and easier to carry loaded guns in public. But I think mostly what we're noticing is momentum um, in all of those blue states and all of those purple states. Uh, we had a referendum in Washington last year, the first time ever this issue, uh, voters said, okay, politicians, if you're not going to do the right thing by the people, we're going to put it to the voters. And it passed by a wide margin. That was the first time ever that path was used, and that same law is going to be before the Nevada voters next year. Now, you're talking about real bellwether states, where if we can get things to the voters to get them passed, because the politicians won't do it, that's going to be, I think, the next the next wave. I want to add on top of the progress that we've seen since Newtown, um, the politics are an interesting question because up until Newtown, the gun lobby was spending 20 or $30 million a year in elections out of their $200 million a year machine. There wasn't any money really on the other side. Those of us doing this work weren't putting a lot of money into the politics. And since Newtown, uh, Mayor Bloomberg launched an organization. Gabby Giffords launched an organization. The Center for American Progress has gotten into the mix. These are huge lobbying organizations. Bloomberg's putting in $50 million a year. And Gabby Giffords is raising tens of millions. So the idea that there's only one side of this debate um, in politics has changed, but it's new. Well, and how much of that is driven by the perception that this is a serious public health issue, or how much should it be? I mean, it absolutely should be, and I think it is. I mean, I think someone like Michael Bloomberg, whatever your opinion of him, he's a person who cares deeply about public health as a lens through which, you know, society can be improved. He believes in bike helmets and smoke anti-smoking and all that sort of thing. And so guns fit really clearly into that, into that view. And I think the understanding that the NRA is putting 20 or $30 million a year into politics, and that's been enough to completely dominate this issue for decades. Um, you know, somebody who's got a lot of money says, you know what, 
I can neutralize that. It might not happen overnight, but over time, we can neutralize at least that piece of the impact, especially when you have 90% of the people behind it. So, you know, that gives me a lot of hope because you see how, you know, where there is the soft spots in um, the, the reticence on this issue, it, it can be overcome. Um, and it is for the first time in, I mean, the NRA has basically for 40 years been alone politically on this issue. And now they've got some serious competition and things are changing. The, the um, races in Virginia were absolutely astounding. Uh, Terry McAuliffe ran in Virginia for governor and he ran on a pro gun control platform. Gun regulation was one of his main platforms in the state of Virginia, which is where the NRA headquarters are. And he won. And it was really profound to watch that happen because something like that had not really ever happened before, certainly not in a state like Virginia. Um, so you, I think you are seeing that sort of common wisdom about you can't support gun control measures and win elections shift, but it takes time to sort of catch up, I think, is my sense of it. Mm -hmm. I wanna bring in another audience question here and put my own profession on the chopping block. Um, how does the media's role play into all this? And, and what is the media getting wrong? Pastor I, McBride? I remember um, we were in the task force meeting at the White House with the Vice President and some of the um, clerics from the Sikh community um, shared with us how they went to meet with the uh, uh, Producers Guild in Hollywood to talk about the way they uh, uh, were being portrayed, being perceived as Muslims, the Sikh community, um, although, you know, they're not, but, you know, like the, these kind of caricatures in TV shows like 24 was one of the ones they mentioned specifically, just being over-associated with terrorists. And, and how those conversations with the producers actually helped to shift the way uh, Muslims and Middle Eastern uh, religions and people are portrayed in the media. <laughs> All that to say, um, I think that advocating for media to be more representative of um, communities beyond the caricatures and the stereotypes is an important uh, advocacy tool that must be used um, in the, in the uh, months and years to come. Color of Change is a very important um, organization that we work with that have actually been able to track, particularly in New York, how the, the news agencies over-report um, incidences of violence, particularly gun violence, in African-American and urban communities over and against our white and Asian counterparts, um, which again gives this perception that African-American and urban communities are much more violent um, than other communities, um, particularly in the public imagination. Now, of course, if we all believe that, um, then it will in turn follow that uh, we need to do, spend more money on police, more money on probably buying guns to keep in our homes to protect us from the boogeyman out there, right? So I, I do think we have to figure out more ways to move beyond media caricatures and hold media accountable for misinformation um, and misrepresentation that often feeds stereotypes and appeals to our worst selves. And Dr. Choi, what about in terms of the, the medical community and, and how the media covers gun violence in the context of, of medicine? What's missing there? Well, I think that, you know, I, I always use my children as a litmus test, you know, where I drive my kids to school in the morning, listen to NPR, and there are whole, you know, weeks where I just can't even play it because it's just too hard for them to listen. I think I'm not, say, I'm not necessarily advocating that we should turn a blind eye to these many issues. Um, but on the flip side, you know, to provide a balanced perspective and whether that be, um, you know, talking through it, talking about these larger issues, as Pastor McBride has mentioned, um, and also potential solutions towards um, you know, improving uh, those circumstances, having a thoughtful discussion around mental health, you know, that's that's just that's it. I mean, we the mental health parity has been something that we've been talking about and fighting for for decades and still has not gotten um, the, the necessary to do. Um, and so drilling down to really, you know, what are the true challenges, um, um, you know, at that have led up to this um, particular situation, I think are, are particularly important. I mean, just, just real quick, uh, to, to maybe put it in a positive way, what would it look like for media to cover the many solutions and the success stories of communities and neighborhoods that are reducing violence just as much 
as they cover the incidents related to violence. Like I think that shift in our consciousness in our reporting could actually catalyze hope and a shift in the way in which we understand the solutions that are right within our grasp that just need scaling up. Um, it will shift, I think, the ways in which we think this problem is intractable and unsolvable. What's a good example of that that you think the media could be paying more attention to? Well, so I mentioned ceasefire already, um, and uh, we engage in weekly activities, walking neighborhoods in San Francisco and Oakland and Richmond, um, in the neighborhoods that are highest at risk of, of uh, engaging um, or being victimized by gun violence. One powerful program that is starting to get a lot of uh, coverage is the uh, Office of Neighborhood Safety in Richmond, a peacemaker program where we actually take young men who have been caught in these cycles and we put them in cohorts um, of life skills, of peacemaking classes. These are individuals who are deemed as the volume shooters, if you will, and incentivize them to do all kinds of different types of activities that are actually about building their own internal uh, uh, healing and self-sufficiency work. And again, these young people make decisions to stop shooting just with structure, incentivization, and care. Um, if, if I believe if every uh, city in the country started one of these programs that maybe cost $15,000 per person to put a young person into per year, just imagine uh, the, the kind of return on investment, if you will, that would create in a community where $2 million are spent on every uh, gun-related homicide. I think that kind of framing for those who are worried about the fiscal side, uh, for those who are worried about the cost around the, the, the human person or rehabilitation, I think that could do a, a world of good for us shifting our mindset around how we describe and understand solutions to these kinds of problems. I will say there's some great reporting being done, not just to toot your horn, because Mother Jones has done some phenomenal work. The New York Times has done some amazing work in Tampa Bay. They've done some brilliant work on the stand your ground laws. Um, there is some really deep, thoughtful, good reporting happening, but not enough. Um, I think there's a few outlets that are really looking at this issue seriously. Um, but most newspapers are not really tackling this issue with a broad uh, approach and looking at it in terms of what is the real impact, what, are the, what does the research show, what do we know and not know. Um, more often than not, when we get a call from the media, they ask us our perspective on something and then they call the NRA for their perspective, even though the research they cite to has been debunked, <laughs> media will still cite to them. And we're always astounded, you know, why do they feel the need every time we're talking about solutions to allow the other side to make the argument that more guns is the solution when we know for sure through the research that that's not true. Um, and giving voice to that perspective every single time, I think confuses people. It mm -hmm. leaves people thinking, well, maybe I do need a gun to be safe, even though we know that that's not how this works anymore. So, you know, our frustration tends to be that there is a truth here, actually. And the opinion of the other side doesn't always have to be given equal weight to the peer-reviewed research that's, that's being looked at. So. I mean, I think you sort of get both sides there. That's a great point. I think one other, another way that the picture has shifted in terms of the impact of gun violence with, with medicine is the way in which uh, more gunshot victims are surviving now, right? We have better medical technology and better medicine. And how is that changing the picture with this problem, Dr. Choi? I think definitely, you know, when we talk about vets in particular, I think that becomes, you know, uh, becomes sort of a highlight and, and, um, and certainly you know, I think we should be t telling those stories more often. Um, you know, I, I was referring before, you know, every summer we have these young adults um, who, who sit in the wards at San Francisco General for sometimes months. They were unlucky or were just in the wrong place at the wrong time or participants um, in a gunfight, and they got shot in the spinal cord, and they're paralyzed from the neck down. And, every, you know, on a regular basis do we have patients like that. Those types of stories need to be shared. I think the other challenge, you know, when we talk about media and balanced reporting, and I've, I've tried to illustrate, you know, in the last hour, is that in some ways the game is being rigged. You know, when we talk about research that's not being done, that could be done, mm. that people who are supposed to be participating in prevention are not allowed to participate you know, the, by virtue of the fact that some of you who are interested in this topic did not know that, I think is very concerning. Those types of things need to be discussed. 
um, you know, if we want to move things forward, um, we need to also highlight the ways that obstacles are being placed along the way to keep us from making progress. We've reached the point in our program where there's time for one last question, which I'll put to all of our panelists. Um, I think as we've touched on, the politics of guns in our country are intensely polarizing, but they aren't only just polarizing, they're also subject to a, a pretty powerful inertia. Um, from a public health perspective in particular, how can that be overcome? And what could really ch start to change the national conversation? I'm gonna start Dr. Choi. You know, I just have a small example. A couple, about a year or two ago, I was giving a talk to uh, at a National Medical Student Association and talking about this very topic, gun violence and public health. And, you know, I, I was doing my best to, to pre present, present the evidence, to give it a very balanced frame, and to help um, these medical students understand the responsibility that they have um, without necessarily taking a political side as much as our core responsibility as healthcare providers. And at the end of the presentation, I had a medical student raise their hand and say, my mom's a pediatrician, we're both gun owners, we enjoy recreational hunting. So given everything you've told me, what am I supposed to do? And I just thought, wow. My first thought was, I hope I didn't offend them. <laughs> and then my second thought was, wow, what an incredible opportunity. Someone who is committed to the evidence, the information that I just presented, while is a gun owner um, and understands you know, the, that Second Amendment right um, uh, in a very personal way, is the perfect person to be able to articulate these challenges, to walk that line, and to be able to serve in that middle to bridge um, things that the evidence supports, things that steps that we know we can take um, to decrease gun violence in this country. Margot Hirsch? We believe at the foundation that the time is right now for technology to jump in here and address gun violence from an innovation and technology standpoint. And these technologies that are being worked on have the potential to save lives and really impact the issue. And um, it does take changing behavior patterns. But if you look at um, more consumer type uh, products and things that we see in our everyday life like Uber and Tesla, you can change behavior through products. And we'd like to believe that these safety technologies will have an impact on um, predominantly suicides and ac accidental deaths, but even a trickle-down effect on homicides. For, so when guns are stolen, they'll be rendered useless once they get into the hands of the wrong, into criminals or the wrong hands. And so we believe that technology can play a really important part in addressing gun violence today. Pastor McBride. We always say that the first revolution has to always be an internal revolution, a revolution of our values, of our heart, of the way in which we see and understand the world. So I will certainly continue to advocate for us all imagining how can we put ourselves in positions to experience revolutions um, uh, of, of new perspectives and ideas that could um, catalyze us to further action, which I think would be the Second thing I'll say is um, a disorganized truth cannot defeat an organized lie. So what does it mean for us to organize ourselves around these truths? As Robin and many of us have talked about health, technology, policy, and uh, really push back against the very organized lies that have structured our society. And again, I think that that requires all of us to take a look at fear and race and economics and um, politics and many of these things that uh, may be a, a little bit off-putting for us. So um, prayerfully we'll all do that together. Robin Thomas from a policy-making perspective. Um, I think we have to really all know and believe that there are solutions. There are so absolutely solutions to this problem. We actually know what they are. We know what the answer to this problem is. Never mind the fact that this is a country where generally we believe that we can find answers even when we don't have them. We actually have them in this case. So I think knowing that, believing that, being educated um, to what Michael said, being courageous enough to speak out that this isn't a, a political wedge issue you know, in the way that many others have changed, like marriage equality, having the courage to say, 
if you want to have a gun, that's fine, but we're going to regulate the heck out of them because we need to protect our children, protect our communities, do a better job of preventing gun violence. And I'm not going to be quiet about it. You're not going to give me a dirty look because you love your gun and I'm going to shut my mouth because people are dying. Um, so I think there's a level of informativeness and courage that has to come along with this debate, whichever your perspective is, um, that we really promote. We believe in research-driven truth and answers. And, and I hope that all of you got a little bit of that tonight. Our thanks to the California Wellness Foundation for underwriting this program and to our panelists, Dr. Ricky Choi, who serves on the board of directors for the National Physicians Alliance, Margot Hirsch, president of the Smart Tech Challenges Foundation, Pastor Michael McBride, lead pastor at the Way Christian Center in Berkeley, California, and director of urban strategies at PICO National Network, and Robin Thomas, executive director of the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. We also thank our audiences here and on the radio and internet. I'm Mark Fullman, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.